from Bitcoin, blockchain or distributed ledger technology to cryptocurrencies, tokens and initial coin offerings. It seems everyone involved has something to say, but can you really trust their advice? One man's had enough of weasel words and charlatans and is ready to give you impartial, independent analysis. With digestible blockchain bytes, ICO analysis and need-to-know news on cryptocurrencies, author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator, Barry James brings you Radio ICO. And it's Barry James again for ICO Radio and the Blockchain Bytes programme. And we're going to talk about one of my, um, well, I guess it's one of my favourite subjects. I seem to talk about it a lot. But this time with Sam Robinson, who is a regulation partner at CMS. Welcome, Sam. Thank you very much for having me. So, uh, not at all. Um, I'm going to be really interested to hear what you've got to say about where we are in the UK and the world uh, in terms of tokens and uh, and and uh, we're seeing a lot of talk about security tokens, but let's go back first. So, how did you get into into how did you get into this fix? How did you get into this world? What what brought you here? <laughs> so, my background is I have always been a regula- in the regulation industry throughout my career. I have been working in this space now for around 18 years or so, and I started my life at the regulator. So I worked at what was then the Financial Services Authority before I then swapped sides and moved into private practice, where I've been working ever since. Uh, In my private practice life, and also at the FCA, I've had a, a focus on the fintech industry, and we do a lot of work in relation to crowdfunding, for example, as well as peer-to-peer lending, payment services, e-money and so on. So it was a a natural fit that that when the the ICO market uh, established itself and came around, uh, that I would find an interest and and focus on that area too. Uh, So we have been doing a fair bit of work in the ICO space in the sense of acting for clients that are issuing their tokens, as well as those that uh, are going to market into various jurisdictions and would just like to confirm exactly how the how their particular tokens are going to be regulated. Mm. It's an interesting space at the moment. Any that you could talk about right now, clients that are in the public domain or whatever, or is that to come? That's to come. We'll save okay. that for the time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, so let's move on to tokens and um, uh, different kinds of tokens. Uh, I think it's becoming increasingly clear to everyone that there are different kinds of tokens. Um we were talking earlier about the taxonomies uh, and the different classifications of tokens, and there's not there's not very wide agreement on that. But could you just take us through uh, may, maybe the the three level taxonomy? I think it was uh, Zug Switzerland. Yes, yes, I can indeed talk about that now. Obviously, being a UK lawyer, we focus on on the the UK law yes. position, but we obviously keep our ear to the ground, as they say, in what's going on around the world. And the approach taken by Switzerland is quite interesting because they have separated the tokens down into to three different areas, ultimately. The, the utility tokens, the, the payment tokens, and security tokens. And it's quite a proportionate approach, in my view, because utility tokens are, in effect, not regulated in Switzerland because of the fact that they, as the name suggests, they are used to... Uh, to exchange for a particular service. Payment tokens, uh, again, as the name suggests, are used to to pay for goods or services, and they have certain AML checks uh, forced upon them, or should I say, or should I say, requested upon them Mm. in the sense of what's required under Swiss law. And then you have security tokens. And this is where things get a bit more interesting from my perspective, being a regulatory lawyer, because security tokens are regulated in Switzerland in the same way that any other share sale would be, for example. Mm. And that's an approach that a number of other regulators have said as well, including the FCA, for example, here in the UK. Uh, Some of the listeners may know that the FCA has put out a number of statements saying how each ICO needs to be considered on its own merits to determine whether or not the tokens fall within the UK securities laws. Mm. 
and securities tokens are more than likely going to and have to comply with the relevant requirements not only in Switzerland but the UK or whichever country it may be if they're within that definition. It gets slightly more complicated if you took a look at the overseas markets because what's the security in different countries is different. So for example in the US it's a very different test uh, to what we have in the UK. The, the US again people probably heard of the Howey test or the Huey test mm. uh, however you pronounce it um, but it's a very different test to what we have over here in the UK. Okay, so could you just characterise those tests for, for listeners for me, please? How, how do they differ? Sure. So, so in the UK, we have different types of securities. So these securities include, for example, shares in a company or futures or options contracts, debentures. So it's a very much an instrument test because if the instrument is a security, then it's going to, well, if a, sorry, say if a token amounts to a instrument of security, then it's going to be regulated in the UK. Mm. In the US, for example, it's much more of a features test. If mm. the, the features are akin to what someone would expect of an investment, then the US regulator is taking the view that that's going to be a security. So rather than the UK, which is then the instrument test, you have mm. a definition of a futures contract, for example. If you're in, you're in. If you're out, you're out. Mm. Whereas in the US, they have a number of different features and they look at those features for any particular token and can apply them. But, but the, the recent uh, say publications and notices that have come out of the US is that, that that's being interpreted quite widely to catch a lot of tokens. It, we're not being it's not a narrow definition at all here okay and in a, in the us they've kind of taken a very broad brush approach to this hasn't haven't they um and but it differs here it does here as i say one part of of our job and what we do is determining whether something is a security token or not so we review the the white paper and the features and then come to a view on which, which side of the line we will be on any particular ico and that really is kind of the starting point because going from there, that then relates to the marketing restrictions and whether you can list on any of the secondary exchanges and so on. So everything really stems from that analysis. So um, the head of the um, SEC has famously said he's never seen a token mm -hmm. that he didn't regard as a security token. Presumably you have then. <laughs> We have indeed, from a UK perspective. Yes. Yes. There, there, there is. There's many tokens out there that, from a UK law perspective, are, are utility tokens that would not be regulated so, at the current time. So the door isn't shut on utility tokens for the UK. No, definitely not, and that's quite clear from the statements that the FCA have published as well. Mm. In, in contrary to the SEC statements, the FCA's ones say you need to look at the features of any particular ICO mm. to determine whether or not it's regulated. So mm. the FCA's approach is very much a, a, a tokens can fall either side of the line mm. in regards to regulation. Okay, that's good to, good to hear from you. Uh, having said that, there's a lot of excitement building uh, worldwide, I think, but it's in the UK as well, about um, tokenized securities do you are you seeing that as well and what do you what do you make of that we are actually that's a, a good question because we're seeing a lot more of it now than we did maybe a month or two or even three months ago because because of the, the utility token market and maybe with the price of cryptocurrencies dropping significantly over the last few months people are looking at ways to entice people into their particular ICO. Mm. And one way you can do that is by giving certain rights attaching mm. to those tokens. So maybe a dividend or mm. a share in the profits of the business or something that makes you stand out from other token sales. And when you do this, you're more likely to fall within the security token uh, definition than mm. the utility token definition. So we have been seeing a lot more interest of people wanting to be security tokens rather than trying to avoid being security tokens. Okay, and to what extent, kind of crossing that line, you know, and, and all the compliance mm -hmm. that comes with that, what, what's the impact on, um, on, on the sort of cost profile and, uh, you know, is, is there a lot of friction that comes with that? It does bring with it a, a, some more hoops to jump through, you could say, mm. by being regulated, as you would expect, because you're moving into the, the regulated environment. So you need to think about how you're going to market a security token. In the UK, we have something called the financial promotion regime, 
that we need to think about. And there's also the prospectus rules that apply to offerings of securities. So in effect, you're, you're applying the same rules that a company does when they issue shares in that company, either a listed company or a private company, but you're applying the same rules and procedures to the security token market. Mm. So we need to think about that. For example, for the prospectus rules, if you are falling within certain exemptions, then everything is still quite straightforward. Mm. But if you're not, then you need an approved prospectus and everything becomes a lot more problematic. So we go through the exemptions and they hopefully find a way so that we do not need to comply with those requirements, because otherwise it, it, that's when it really does become more burdensome. Okay, so except, uh, uh, exemptions are really important in that respect. Okay, um, but just to kind of understand that line a little bit, better a little bit more clearly um you know if if someone was looking at creating um a, a uk based utility token um you know what what would where's the line what what would what does that look like so if you're trying to get to a uk based utility token the, the best way is to do it. I mean, in the UK, I should say that we, we look at something that's either regulated or not regulated. So the unregulated includes both utility and payment tokens in that sense, because yeah. they're not going to be in the security token definition. Mm. So the unregulated tokens, if someone wants to be in that category, then they can be a, a utility or a payment token. Mm -hmm. uh, or, in effect, you can be a hybrid of the two, where mm. you can be used as a payment and a utility token. Yeah. Now, when people are wanting to fall that side of the line, then we really need to structure the tokens in such a way that there's not those additional rights based on the profit share of the business, for example, yeah. so that there's not any additional rights linked to those tokens. So, for example, if I participate in the ICO and I get my token, I then have a couple of options with that token. I can use it on whatever goods or services are available. I can use it to pay for some goods or services, or I can sell it on one of the secondary markets on the understanding that it's actually listed there on the, in the first place. Mm. But for the time being, while I hold that token, I wouldn't get any rights from the company. And the company, you know, it could mm. go on to be another unicorn, but it mm. wouldn't make any difference to me as a token sure. holder. Sure, sure. So, so if someone is structuring a utility token, there's the thought process and the points that we think about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, another interesting dimension on that is, you know, as you know well from your um, background with crowdfunding, um, very often, and, and I'm talking now about sort of uh, not equity crowdfunding, but, but you know, the Kickstarter model, mm -hmm. um, uh, very often people are putting money towards something with, with an expectation of something's going to arrive in the post or whatever. Mm -hmm. But, you know, starting from scratch, knowing that there's innovation risk, there's, there's a company to be built probably as well as a, as a product. Um, uh, with utility tokens, some people have raised that as an issue. How do you see that with utility tokens? So a lot of the companies, not all of them, mind, but a lot of them are at the proof of concept stage. Mm. They are, it's very much a plan saying we are going to do this and we're going to do that. And, and I suppose the, the do your own research phase uh, phrase comes into play here mm. because so you, p people should do exactly that, know what they're going into. Like any other mm. company that you were going to invest in, for example, you should to look at the business model, work out, look at the team and so on, mm. and then decide whether it's something that, that you, you think is going to go all the way. Not, I mean, is, they, these are proof of concept businesses in a lot of times. So provided people aren't misled, and people are transparent and clear about what they're doing, that's not necessarily a problem. So the white paper and so on should be clear and, and should mislead people. And if, if we have a security token, there's, there's many rules around ensuring that's not the case yeah. because they're in a regulate, regulated environment. Yeah. Um, so the, the white, but while they do vary greatly, I'm sure if you, you can Google any white paper and see that the quality and, and content does differ, 
Um, but, but the idea, at least the ones that, that we work on, is that everything is clear, fair, not misleading, and people can understand what the product is and the plans for the future. Yeah, and as, as you know, because I gave you a glimpse earlier, <laughs> uh, we're very keen on this, on, on transparency in particular, and within the token intelligence platform, we rate um, white papers and ICs on their transparency for exactly these sorts of reasons. Uh, but... Moving on back briefly, uh, we're going to run out of time soon, I'm afraid, uh, because I know you're, you're, you're due on the podium shortly. Um, but moving back to security tokens briefly, I guess one of the most interesting things about security tokens is they're, they're born with liquidity in the sense that they're, they're a token, they're a, a currency. So... Um, you know, uh, whereas, you know, uh, private shares, you know, are te- generally illiquid, particularly for early stage companies, uh, they're, they're, they're kind of born liquid. Do you see, how do you see that? Is that is that a hugely positive thing? Is it problematic or what? So when we say born liquid, so to speak, so the company will issue the token. Mm-hmm. Like any other company share, they're not normally redeemable back to the company. Mm-hmm. They, they are totally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the liquidity only really comes into play if, to the extent that they, you can sell them to somebody else. Yeah. So you need to have, or well, the company needs to arrange, in most cases, for a listing on one of the secondary exchanges. Yeah. So that's where the liquidity comes into play, in, in the same sense of the utility token. Mm. It's the company and, and the listing on one of the secondary markets that works. The difference for the security tokens is the platforms, if they are arranging deals in security tokens, inadvertently also fall within the world of regulation. Mm. Uh, and that's the reason why a lot of them do not wish to uh, list, so to speak, security tokens mm. on their platforms. Okay. Okay, well, there's lots more we could be talking about, but you've got some other talking to do very soon. One last word of advice or anything you'd like to share with listeners before we close? Um, just that the, the market is changing, very much so. I'd like say it's useful to keep up to date with the, the regulation in different jurisdictions, particularly the UK. Well, I suppose I would say that being a, a UK regulatory lawyer. Um, but we spoke about to do your own research on ICOs earlier and, and just review the white papers but it's an interesting industry and I'm sure develop in the future and um, thank you so much if people want to to find you they find you at cms dash cmno.com is that right that's right my details are there yeah details are there so Sam thank you for your time this afternoon and uh, I'm sure uh, we'll speak again at some point hopefully not before too long (laughs) thanks bye for now ICO Radio was brought to you by author, speaker, transparency and clarity advocate and award-winning software innovator Barry James. Get in touch with the programme. Put yourself or someone else forward as a guest. Visit iconewsdesk.com. And if you've enjoyed the show, please leave a review. And don't forget to subscribe to get your next insights and interviews from the ICO Radio podcast.